Welcome to the Words in Season podcast. My name is Kara Marie Morris and I'm your host. Thank you for tuning in to episode two where we are talking about what the Lord has given us as Christians that we have the ability and the privilege to give back to Him. Last week we looked at the Old Testament and how the priests, they offered sacrifices continually as God lit the fire, they kept it burning. And the same that we are able to keep that fire burning in us. So this week we're going to start looking about what God has given us that we can offer Him. So thank you for tuning in. Remember you can find more episodes on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But most importantly, remember every time that you tune in, every time that you open your Bible, that Jesus has a word in season for you. When life's got me weary, when I'm feeling tired, just one word in season and my heart goes to life. So last week we looked at what God has given us that we have as Christians that we can give back to Him. That God has given us something so precious that He sent His Son to die for it. And of course, we know that is our life. John 3, 16, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world, that He even gave up His only begotten and unique Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish or come to destruction, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge Him and to judge the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. So God gave the life of his son and his son came as a man. He lived as a man, all man and all God on the earth. And he willingly gave this life. And now because he said, I'm going to send you another helper as he was ascending into heaven. And now he's enabled us through the power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. He has enabled us to do the same works and greater works that Jesus did on the earth. And one of the biggest things that we can do is we can give everything that we have back to him. God said he wants everything. He doesn't want to just leave any part out because he knows that it's better. Our lives are better. Our emotions, our dreams, our hopes, our finances, all of that is better in his hands our hands guided by his hands than in our hands alone. He knows that if there's anything in our hands, I know from experience, if there's anything in my own hands and I try to control it, I try to make it something that it's not, or I try to figure it out on my own without asking the Lord for help, that's when it goes wrong. That's when I destroy it. That's when there, there it, it just, yeah, maybe there may be an accolade for a moment, but there's not an eternal reward. And so that's why... God is asking for everything, just like he asked for a commitment from his son. His son could have done anything. He had a free will on earth, but Jesus laid his life down. He came as a man. He died. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And even during that time, he was our example of now empowered by the same Holy Spirit that Jesus was empowered by, that we can willingly lay our lives down, that we can give the same commitment. So I want to look at a commitment this week that's in the Old Testament in Genesis 22, something that was so precious. We're going to look at the father Abraham, the father of our faith. Father Abraham, he said in Genesis 22, he said, after these events, God tested and proved Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. And God said, take now your son your only son Isaac, whom you love, to the region of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. So remember in the scriptures, it said that Isaac was promised. This is the son of promise that him and his wife, they had in their old age. It was, it was when they were beyond the childbearing age, when it seemed impossible, and then they finally received this son of promise, Isaac. He said he took Isaac with him, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. And then he began the trip to the place which God had told him. 
And on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And Abraham said to his servants, Settle down here and stay a while with the donkey. And I and the young man will go yonder and worship and come back to you. So then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac. And he took the fire in his own hand, the fire pot and the knife, and the two of them went on together. And Isaac said to Abraham, My father, he said, Here I am, my son, Isaac. He said, See, here's the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt sacrifice? Because in those days, all worship required sacrifice. All connection with the Lord required a bloodshed. And all that would be pointing to when Jesus would come as a baby and Jesus would lay his life down and Jesus would shed his blood on the cross. Just like G uh, Isaac here is a picture of Jesus that of laying his life down. He even carried that wood on his back. And Jesus would do that so many years later for all mankind. So Abraham said, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two went on together and they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar and on the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took hold of the knife to slay his son. But an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay a hand on the lad or anything on him. For I know that now you fear and revere God, since you have not held back from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son. And then Abraham looked and glanced around, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering as an ascending sacrifice instead of his son. And so Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that since you have done this thing and have not withheld from me or begrudged me, giving me your only son, in blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sands of the seashore and your seed in error, and they will possess the gates of his enemy. And in your seed, this is another picture of Christ in all of the sort, in all of the story, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed and bless themselves because you have heard and obeyed my voice. God asks for everything from us, not just a little bit of us. When we got saved, you're not just a little bit saved or not just part of you is saved, but God wants everything. Why? Because he knows that it's best for us, that our lives in our own hands are such a small thing, but our lives given back to the creator, to the life giver, it is multiplication for generation. It can produce something that is eternal and meaningful and fulfilling and satisfying and full of joy and rest and peace when we simply give it back to Him. What do I give back to Him? Of course, I give my life when I believed in my heart and confessed with my mouth that Jesus Christ is not just Savior of my life, but now He is Lord. It means I take the hand off of control over my life and I submit to Him. So to me, this is a picture of what we can give. What did, what did Abraham give? He gave Isaac the most precious thing that he had. He gave back the son of promise. So what does God ask from us? God asks for everything, but what does God give us back in return? Like it says here, it says that the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the lad or anything on him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not held back from me or begrudged me your son, your only son. And then Abraham looked and glanced around and beheld, there was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, so that Abraham was the one that did not hold anything back from God. And what did God give back to him? His son. And what did God give back to us? 
everything. He asks for everything as we declare him as Savior and Lord. And what do we get back? We get back everything because he knows that it's best for us. So I can give him the most precious thing that he has given me. I can give him my life. Abraham was so committed to, the, to following the Lord that even in the beginning of the story, it says that God tested and proved him. And God said to him, go and take your son Isaac and go to the mountains and offer him as a burnt offering there. And it says in verse 3, it says, Abraham rose early the next morning. It wasn't a debate. He didn't question it for three years, but he was willing to go. And I know from the time from, I was just thinking about this story, from the time that I knew I had it in my heart to go to Bible school and then to the time that I was actually ready, it was over three years. It took time, but God is so patient with us. He is enduringly patient, extraordinarily patient, not willing that any should perish. So he was, he, he was so patient for me as I was trying to decide, should I go to Bible school or should I not to go to Bible school? Is this the devil telling me to go to Bible school? I had so many things because I knew I was going to have to leave my job, leave my hometown, leave the church, the only church that I had ever known, leave the pastors, the only pastors I had ever known. And it was going to be something so new and it was something I couldn't see with my eyes. But as God worked with me, as God so lovingly and was patient with me, he began to build an image of faith in me. And as I began to go, I moved away and started in Bible school. You know, that first semester and first uh, terms that we had at the Bible school, it was like I just sat in the classroom in the back and I just would weep because I thought, I, I thought I knew it all. I thought I knew everything. And I came to Bible school and I found out I didn't know anything. And as we go into the Word of God, that's a fresh revelation. It's not that we don't know anything as that God is condemning us saying, you don't know anything. But when you begin to open the Word of God, you begin to see how vast, how endless, how eternal, how ever reaching, how there is an answer to every question. That's why we need to see Him is because He is the answer to every question. So as God was asking Abraham for everything, it says that he tested him and he proved him. And this was a picture of worship and worship in those times always involved a sacrifice. And today it's the same. And we don't have a high priest going into the, it says in Hebrews that Jesus is that high priest that once and for all, he finished that work. In Hebrews 9, 12, it says, And he once and for all went into the Holy of Holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, like we saw in this picture with Abraham in Genesis 22, by which making reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, the blood of Jesus, having found and secured complete redemption and everlasting release for us. For if the mere sprinkling of unholy and defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and ashes and burnt heifer is sufficient for purification of the body, how much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit, his own pre-existent divine personality, has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God to purify our consciences from dead works and from lifeless observances, observances, to serve the ever living God. So Christ the Messiah is therefore the negotiator, the mediator of this new agreement. So this was a picture in Genesis 22 of what worship looked like. God asking for everything and, and Abraham being willing to give what was the most important, even more important than his own life, was the life of his son, being able to carry on as an heir and as that seed and God asked for the most important thing and Abraham trusted God and was willing enough that he rose up early the next morning 
And he said, I don't know, in his mind, he said, I don't know how it's going to happen, but me and my son, we're going to go and worship and we're going to come back. Even though he knew that God said to sacrifice his son on that hill. He had enough confidence in what God said he would surely bring it to pass. And today, fast forward into the New Testament that Jesus Christ, he is that once and for all sacrifice. So now what is that picture of worship for me today? It's me getting up on that altar and saying, Father, and there's a phrase that comes to mind. It's nothing less, nothing more, nothing else at any cost. Doing the will of the Father, putting my life on the altar means nothing less, nothing more, nothing else at any cost. And that was the picture of Abraham worshiping by sacrificing his son. And that is today my picture of worship as I say, God, you can have everything. You can have this life that you have given me. I have no life except for you. So in Romans 4.21, it says that Abraham was fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he promised. So God was able to tell what was in his heart. He proved what was in his heart. Of course, God knows everything, but God proved out what was in his heart by asking for the most important thing to him, his life of his son. And God is asking that from us. He's asking for the most important thing, the most precious thing that we have to give him. And that is our lives. And that is part of this material for sacrifice that we have. So Abraham passed the test of who had his heart, not his kids, not his family, not his riches, not his own comfort. But Abraham humbled himself and he yielded himself and God was able to work through him. And it allowed Abraham to guard his heart, the most precious thing. This proving allowed him to guard his heart that his son wasn't the most important thing, that his comfort wasn't the most important thing, that his own life wasn't the most important thing. But it was doing the will of God. And how it all works out, it wasn't up to Abraham. And he didn't have to figure it out. And he was willing to say, God, even if I go and I sacrifice my son, I'm going to, some, somehow he said, I'm going to bring my son back when we come back. From worshiping, we're going to come back and meet our group and go home. Whether he raised Isaac from the dead, Abraham did not concern himself of how and when and what and all the details. All he did was step out in faith on the word of the Father. So the last scripture is Proverbs 4.23. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that, guard for it because out of that flows the springs of of life out of our heart flows our life and god wants to know what is in our heart he has the right and he has the ability not to tempt us and try us with sickness and disease and poverty but he has every right to test us to prove what is in our hearts because it's best for us we have the privilege of giving our lives back and passing these faith tests so that we can and do have the ability to go from faith to faith. Before we go from glory to glory, we have to go through from faith to faith. Because if we were to receive something that we weren't ready for, then God would have given us something that would destroy us. And that is not his nature. God proved Abraham's life by asking the thing that meant the most to him, the son of promise. And God is doing the same. He is asking for the, this material for sacrifice. He's asking for our lives. He's asking for us to live our lives on the altar, saying nothing less. God, I live to do nothing less, nothing more, nothing else at any cost, no matter the comfort, no matter where it's going to come from, no matter how it's going to happen, no matter if I can see it or don't see it, or if it's my family or if my family has never done this. It is beyond all of those things and just being able to be a living sacrifice and continually consecrate and dedicate our lives to Him because He knows that our lives flow from our heart 
And if he can prove that only he has our heart's affection, that that is the safest place, the best place, the most joyful place, the most restful place that we can be. So thank you for tuning in to part two of Material for Sacrifice. And remember, most importantly, that every time that you open the Bible for yourself, that Jesus always has a word in season for you. God bless you. Thank you.